Welcome to Stetson Law Live, an online, interactive, informational event for prospective students of Stetson University College of Law. On today's program, Darren Kettles, Roberta Flowers. Our topic today, the LLM degree in elder law. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Stetson University College of Law, Stetson Law Live. We're actually live on the campus um, today, and we are reporting today on the LLM and Elder Law. And my name is Darren Kettles. I'm the Director of Admissions here at Stetson, and I'm joined by my colleague, Professor Roberta Flowers, and she'll introduce herself in just a moment. So, But thank you for your interest in our program. We're going to try and get all your questions answered, and hopefully this will start a new professional path for all of you. So, um, Professor Flowers, why don't you do a quick introduction of yourself sure. too, and we'll get right into um, our program. Yeah, I'm excited to be here also. I always love talking about our LLM program here at Stetson. Um, as Darren said, my name is Bobby Flowers. I am a professor here at Stetson College of Law. I'm also the director of the Center for Excellence in Elder Law here, um, where we have a variety of different programs, one of which is our LLM. And I'm also, I, I'm very blessed um, to also be the director of the LLM um, here at Stetson. So I can tell you a little bit about our program. Um, we're very excited about our program. It's been going on now since 2007. Um, we have over 100 graduates and um, we are so happy to give you information uh, about contacting those folks uh, if you are interested because they're going to tell you what an amazing program it is also. So Darren, it's great to be here. Thank you. Yes, great. So we are actually going to post this live on YouTube or on YouTube this afternoon. So for those of you that have a question or something, by all means you can comment on that YouTube post and we will get you those responses for you as they come up. So hopefully we'll try and address everything we can today. So hopefully you won't be in that situation where you won't get all the questions um, answered. So, um, so let's just get started. I mean, having done a distance learning program before too, I know what it's like where you're kind of trying to embark on something and figure out what do I need to do to be successful in this program. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about elder law in general. So, I mean, so why would somebody want to do a program in elder law? I mean, they all have their JDs already because right. you have to do, you have to have that prior. So why would somebody want to get this advanced sort of professional degree? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because we have a variety of different reasons why students come to our LLM program. Uh, we have those students who are just fresh out of law school um, and have decided they didn't get enough in their undergrad or their in their in their JD program mm -hmm. on elder law and they really want to do elder law and so they want to really jump start their knowledge in elder law. So we have newbies, right? We also have people that have been in the practice of law for a lot of years, but they haven't been in the practice of elder law. And now they want to move out of that area they're in and move into elder law. And again, they want to get the kind of knowledge that will help them serve those vulnerable clients right, right from the very beginning. And so we get some of those folks. We also get people who have actually been in elder law for a long time, but want to come back and kind of take a deep dive into the law again and really start thinking about, you know, really the area of elder law from not just a practical standpoint, but from a more academic standpoint. So why would you do a, a degree in elder law? A variety of different things. Uh, but I will tell you why you would want to do a degree in elder law period. And that is because I will tell you without a doubt, elder law attorneys are some of the most satisfied lawyers you will ever meet. They love what they do. They love helping clients. They love being able to have someone come in totally burdened with how are they going to take care of their special needs child when they die? You know, how are they going to make sure that their kids are taken care of? How are they going to make sure that everything goes right when they're no longer here? Or how are they going to, a family comes in in crisis and is how are they going to pay for the nursing home care that their mom now, mm -hmm. now needs. <clears throat> Elder law attorneys take those problems, lift them off of their shoulders, and people leave an elder law attorney's office like 10 pounds lighter, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. it's such a, a phenomenal way to serve people. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, and I can certainly relate to that because, you know, aging parents, I mean, I've known people that had, had somebody just suddenly pass in their family too that never had 
their things in order too. So right. when you think about just wills and you right. know the challenge of the probate and all these things too, but right. getting organized with that part of your life, right. um, sure, and helping other people do that, I exactly. think it's terrific. So, so, well, so, so let's talk a little bit about the structure. So the structure is an online program. So it's right. an online program that this is offered. So it's it's conducive for people that actually have busy lives per se. So Absolutely. I mean, some working professionals, some could be like you know parents taking care of family, right. and, you know, kids at home. Right. Um, you could have other obligations. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of the program sure. and the commitment that is going to take for someone to embark on this. All right. Well, our program is asynchronous, which means that you can be online whenever it works for you. You don't have to be online at a very specific time um, that everybody else is online. So we have had people in Alaska take our course, people in Hawaii take our course. So I would be getting up in the morning to answer um, on the discussion board and they would be at the end of their day at night answering the, the disc discussion board. So whatever it works as far as timing for you, it works very well. We have had a lot of people who uh, had family. Uh, and one of the nice things about our program, I believe, is that we really truly try to work with you. We understand that you're not a JD student that has put everything aside and is now taking a JD program. You're an LLM student, which means you've got family, you've got cases, you've got clients, you've got things that are going to come up. And so we're able to kind of work with that, work around those issues um, when, when those issues occur. Uh, this last semester, we had a hurricane, right? Hurricane Michael. I mean, we had two of our LLM students that were involved in that. Well, we were able to work with them, mm -hmm. right? To have them continue the program at, 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 in their own way. So the flexibility of an online program is really phenomenal. Yeah. And I said, I've done an online program too. And, and I think when you have good resources, you have people that are accessible, that they're on top of it. If you submit questions, you need answers, um, that they're actually going to be there for you. So, well, that sounds really great. And hopefully it will, you know, it's worked for a lot of people over the, it over, has. over the years in what, 2007, you said the program actually exactly. began. So, so is there an in-person requirement component to our Elder Law LLM? Yeah. I mean, is there something like they actually have, physically have to be here? Um, yeah. You know, what is that going to look like? Yeah, there is one uh, requirement that you actually be in person on campus. And I'm going to tell you, it sounds like a requirement and it turns out to be everybody loves it. Take my word for it. So we invite them to come to the Special Needs Trust Conference. We don't have an actual course on special needs trusts, even though a lot of elder law attorneys get involved in special needs trusts. It's not squarely in elder law. So instead of having a course on special needs trusts, we invite you to come to our conference. The conference has been going on now for 21 years. Um, it is the biggest special needs trust conference in the country. And you will attend that conference for two days. What's nice about it is that you guys all get to meet each other. We get to meet you. We have a, a, a little banquet um, one night so we can get to know everybody. And then on the Saturday after the conference, you actually come to campus because the conference is at a, a local hotel. And so you come to campus and we do what's called a select topics day where we pick some really hot topics and bring in practitioners to talk about it. That's also the day you can get your computer uh, ready to go. Um, we take pictures of you with your, your robe on so you're ready to grab graduate. We do a lot of the administrative stuff that we need to do that same day. Um, but it's a great opportunity. We have a lot of our LLM students that come back year after year for our conference mm -hmm. um, because I will say, because I'm not involved with it, Professor Morgan puts together the most phenomenal speakers ever on topics that are so interesting from hoarding to you know benefits. Um, and so that's the only time you're required to come on campus. You have to do that one time before you graduate. We suggest it in the first fall semester, that's the best time for you to come. But again, if something comes up, last year we had somebody that had his kid's wedding and he was like, well, I can listen to it. And we're like, no, wait till next year and you can come next year. So we work around the schedule, but that's the one time you have to be on campus. Yeah, I think we have some really phenomenal members of our faculty or faculty that actually participate in this program. So, mm -hmm. you know, I feel really good. I know your colleague, um, Rebecca Morgan, I mean, she's probably one of the national most well-known members of Elder Law. I mean, yep, I talk about her a lot along with you. And I know you both collectively have got a bunch of awards, actually, for your work that you're doing within Elder Law. So I think you're certainly trailblazers in the industry. So, I mean, can you talk a little bit about the faculty um, that are Absolutely. involved in this? And yeah. how do we identify the faculty?
faculty that are best suited for this program. All right. Well, we are very proud to have um, so many former presidents of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. Um, and we have one that's going to be teaching in the fall that just finished his term um, as the president of NALA. Um, so we're what we are looking for when we are looking for people to teach in our program are people that have really made a name for themselves in elder law. Because you need to understand, although this is a very academic program, it's a program where we really dig down deep in the academics of it, it's also a very practical program. And so we wanna make sure that we have practitioners that really know their stuff, um, that are really the best of the best. Um, and so, for example, in my elder law ethics class, we don't just talk about ethics up here, but we actually write policies for the office, right? So we want you to take away not only an academic degree, but some real practical steps that you can do in your elder law practice. Um, and that's why we have um, the best practitioners, we believe, mm. in the nation teaching in the different different parts of the program. Yeah. Well, I do know, um, you know, working with debts and admissions for as long as I have to, I mean, we continually have people that are asking about our elder law program. So I'm always happy to talk about it too. And this is taking it to a whole new level for sure. So, um, so the program is 25 credits and Correct. it typically, I mean, it, it sounds to me like there's different variables in time in order to complete it. Absolutely. And I think you have a certain amount of time to complete it as well. So 25 credits. So, so what is, you know, how quickly could somebody do a program like this and, and how how long do some people take to do this sure um, yeah and it's it's absolutely um, structured to be that way you have to get it completed from the day you start in six years all right so you've got a six year time span to get it done now we have had people that have taken one course a semester and they slowly got their degree, I think in about four and a half years, might have been five years, all right? Other people have slammed it, right? And gotten it done in a year. But I'm gonna tell you, if you are full-time working, that's crazy talk, right? You really want to look at not more than, and, and I strongly, strongly suggest not more than two courses the first semester. Mm -hmm. Now, later on, you may feel yeah. comfortable because you can take up to three courses any one semester, but that first semester, especially if you haven't been in school for a while, you're really kind of, and, and if you haven't done an online class, right, you need to get kind of figure it all out. Sure. I think one or two is really the way to go that first year. My budget director doesn't like me saying that, but it's true. Um, we really think that one or two, but you can do it at your own pace. We have summer classes if you want to take it in the summer, but you don't have to take summer classes. A lot of people don't take summer classes. They kind of take a break. Um, and so one of the things that we love is that we are able to, when you come to campus for select topics, is Professor Morgan or myself will sit down with you and actually help you structure out how you will do all of your courses. So you kind of got a feel for, oh, okay, I've got something big coming up that semester, so I may only take one course. Or, you know what, I'm gonna take a course in the summer because you know it'll be a little bit calmer in the summer. So really, you can take those 25 hours um, as fast as you want and get it done in about right. uh, two semesters and a half, which is a basically a summer, or you can stretch it out for as long as you want, as long as you get it done in six years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, um, it sounds like it could work for a lot of people yeah. given that timeline yeah. too, so. Um, actually, the, the current Current president of NELF, which is the National Elder Law Foundation, another um, national organization, the mm -hmm. president actually did take one class for that amount of time and was able to finish it. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, and uh, it sounds to me like it's very personalized. I mean, even though it's a distance program, I mean, people will actually know you. Like, I mean, people oh, will yeah. call, you know, I don't know how, you know, what extremes. I don't know if you do some Skyping for people or if you do some teleconferencing. I mean, I imagine you do whatever right. kind of fits the needs of these students to a certain degree, right. um, you know, because everyone does have different competing schedules for sure. So, Absolutely. Well, so as we get sort of into the commitment, well, let's talk about like sort of break it down maybe on a weekly thing. So, you know, as students are kind of thinking about, okay, well, how can I, how can I fit this into my schedule right now? So, you know, what is a sort of a good example of what it would look like during a week over a semester? Because they're 13 week semesters, I right. understand too. Exactly. And then over the summer, I think there's seven, seven, seven weeks, weeks. Yeah. seven weeks over the summer. So if you plan to do that, you know, just 
just to sort of have a whole sort of game plan as it lays out. So sure. talk about a week, I mean, you know, how the assignments are actually sort of set up. Um, I imagine there's a portal of sorts that you set it up in. Sure. Um, and they're once a week. And you do an outline at the beginning as well, too, right? Right. So we are on Blackboard, right? So that's where you find all of your assignments. So let me just walk through kind of how the assignments work. So there'll be a certain day that your class opens every week. Let's say your class opens on Tuesdays. Okay, so on Tuesday um, of the week, all of the lectures will be um, up, all of the reading assignments will be up, and then there will be a series of discussion board questions, all right? Now, my class is a little bit different because I'm a control freak, I, I confess. Mm -hmm. um, you you only get the reading assignment first. You have to read it, and then the lecture opens up, and then you see the lecture, and then the next lecture opens up, right? So even though I might have four lectures for that week, when you first open the week on Tuesday, you'll only see one reading assignment because I like to make sure that you do what you need to do before you see the lecture, all right? So there's three components in almost every one of our classes. There is the reading assignments, there is the l video lectures, and there is the discussion board. And I'm going to tell you most of the learning on our online classes really happens in the discussion board because we have so many phenomenal people in the class that are able to teach each other, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Like if you're with a, a student that has been doing this for 10 or 15 years, they're going to be teaching you, I hate to say this, as much as I am, yeah. all right? So mm -hmm. we try to encourage people to get their reading and their lectures done in the first two or three days days of the week. All right. Now they're open for the whole seven weeks, but we incur seven days, but we encourage you to do it that way. And then you can get on the discussion board and start having a conversation. Sure. All right. So we probably estimate that, that my three hour class is going to take you probably five hours a week when you include listening to the lectures, doing the reading and, and being in the discussion board. So mm -hmm. we're probably talking about five hours of, of work for a three hour credit. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds doable. Oh, you just have to carve doable. out time. I mean, it's, yeah. you have to think about this whole process yeah. as you're going through it. It's right. like, okay, well, where can I make some time availability to right. sort of set aside yeah. for this program? So, yeah. But what's nice is, is what time you have available. So it's where you can fit that in. I mean, when we do our orientation at the beginning of the LLM program, we try to explain to you, like, put a time on your calendar that that is going to be the time you do this this class yeah. right um, because you've got to you've got to schedule it because we all know we get busy and, mm -hmm. and certain things get pushed off to the side but you can figure out when that is like okay well you know what I'm gonna put the kids to bed at seven and that's <laughs> when I'm gonna do it or I'm gonna get up early in the morning when the kids are still asleep um, and that's when I'm gonna do it so that's the flexibility of being able to figure out when to do that yes so I know you talked about um, reading assignments etc too so I I mean, so beyond what you actually put in the assignments per week, I mean, do they buy their own separate texts, et cetera, too? You just give them references for that? Yeah, some of our classes have, um, the minority of classes have an actual text, right? Um, so for example, in my elder law class, we have an elder law ethics class uh, book. So that's required. Um, most of them are going to have assignments just posted on, you know, that link to different, you know, if you're in uh, government benefits that link to the different palms or, mm. or, you know, the statutes that they need to know. So most of them you don't have a reading assignment or a book, but some of them you do. And yes, they will they will be able to find that information out mm -hmm. on our bookstore. And again, once you are in the LLM, we have an orientation where we introduce you to all of those different pieces of on campus, nice. right? So you get to know about the bookstore and you get to know about admissions, you get to know about financial aid, you get to know about all of the different parts of our campus uh, that you won't be seeing, but you might be needing to interact with. Sure, sure. Okay. Well, it sounds like it's like just to kind of, it's going to serve as, as you kind of go along and, and they're going to get, and they're kind of get spoon fed a little bit of that. So, so, you know, Stetson's a very big campus here, too. So we have a number of programs, including, you know, the JD program and the LLMs that we do offer. So what about the resources here on campus? I mean, do we have an ability to extend those resources to these LLM students? Yes. Um, for example, um, when you are a student in our LLM program, you will have access to Lexis and to Westlaw. All right. So that you were able to use those two um, programs. They're online programs, obviously. Um, our library is open to you. And 
And in our first semester, we introduce you to our research librarian uh, that is in charge of our program. And she's gonna help you figure out how to find things. One of the first classes you'll take is an aging in the law class, and that does require a research paper. And so she is very much involved with helping you um, figure out how to research and get that information. Professor Morgan teaches that class, and she's very helpful in helping you come up with a topic, right? So, because some people are like, oh my gosh, I haven't written something in years and years and years except motions. Not to fear. We have lots of resources here that we're going to help you with. And we also end up, if this is something that interests people, in publishing some of those LLM. Um, yes in our international journals. So if for some reason you wanted to write on something international, you might in fact get something published, which is always you know, kind of fun to see your name on a, on a book somewhere. So don't we have an aging journal here at Stetson? So you, know, you can maybe talk about that for a sure. moment too. So we, it's kind of exciting. Yeah, we have, um, it's called the International Aging Law and Policy Journal, Journal of, and um, we look at comparative mostly, um, but we sometimes take just a, uh, an American article if we have another article that's going to contrast it, right? So we might have an article on guardianship in America if we have a guardianship in Japan being written on. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we, we try to only have international um, articles. The We publish... I'm telling you, from people all over the world, we have uh, currently the volume we're working on right now has somebody from Israel, somebody from Canada, somebody from um, Japan. Um, and so it's really kind of fun because those are articles about how it looks in other countries, sure. um, the different areas of elder law. Yeah. So. Well, that's a nice opportunity for Absolutely. students to consider and maybe aspire to some of those articles and the Absolutely. levels of writing and citation, et cetera, yeah. too. I mean, we're on volume 10 and 11, volume 10 we have an LLM student and in volume 11 we have an LLM student wow. so both of those those journals have LLM um, articles being yeah. published wow that's fantastic so we're well, good sort of getting back to a little bit more with the programming <coughs> and how it's sort of un so I mean classes I anticipate are going to be chosen for you a little bit um, and then there's an elective offering um, potential too so right. I mean can we kind of talk about that a little bit um, in terms of how that's sort of going to be unfolding for them right. um, um, not every class is obviously offered every semester. Um, so that's one of the things we have to talk to you about. Um, your first semester is going to be one of three classes. Um, you're going, if you have not done anything in elder law before, then we put you in what we call our intro class. It is a class that basically goes through all of the elder law areas so that you really can then engage with the other students in elder law. If you already have some experience with that, then we don't put you in that intro class. That intro class is counted as an elective. Um, we also have the um, issue of having you do the aging in the law class, which is Professor Morgan's class. That's a very multi-discipline class, right? So you really learn about all of the disciplines that come together under the, air, under the umbrella of aging. And then usually my ethics class is gonna be uh, taught in the uh, fall semester. Semester. So you would take one of those three classes in your first fall. All right. Um, we have to make sure that you get your required courses done, but we have a variety of electives um, such as veterans benefits. Some people are very interested in veterans benefits, want to do that. Um, some people are very interested in disability law. That's a broader, is a little broader than elder law. And so we, we offer that in the summer. Um, we also offer an ethics course called, or not an ethics course, but an elder law course called representing um, elderly people and it litigation areas of litigation. So yes, at the beginning, we're going to be helping you figure out your courses. Um, that first semester, we, we kind of tell you what you need to take. But after that, you really are, mm -hmm. are able to do that. But you have to keep in mind, when is it offered? Because I have to take it when it's offered because I don't want to have to wait a semester. Now, we've had students that said, look, I'm ready to graduate, but I don't need any of the classes in the spring we give them a leave of absence, right? They take a leave of absence for the spring and then they come back in the fall and take a course that they, they needed for the fall. So yes. mm -hmm. we work around it. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not like a JD program where you take this in the first semester, this in the second first yeah. semester, this in the third semester. So there is some personalization as it, you know, mm -hmm. works everyone's need yeah. there too. So I just want to circle back a little bit too, because we talked about the resources on campus. I wanted to see, um, what about access to professional development, our career and professional development office and our clinical programs office? 
office. I mean, is that something that like these students could actually, especially if they're looking to maybe advance right. um, with this degree? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have one of the best career development, uh, career and professional development um, programs, I think, across the country. Um, we So our students, if they're interested in looking for jobs, can look through um, our program. I will tell you that's not usually the way it happens. What usually happens is that Professor Morgan and I spend some time. I mean, we spend a lot of time traveling throughout the country, um, and we know uh, we placed one of our students in California. We're very excited uh, that he was placed in California through knowing through the LLM program. And so that's something that Professor Flowers, or that's me, Professor Flowers, <laughs> Professor Morgan, and I um, try to help with that kind of professional development by finding out, okay, where do you want to go next? Understanding, though, a lot of times our LLM students are already where they want to be, right? They're not looking for jobs um, or they're looking. We had one LLM student um, who's now teaching in our master's program who wanted to go out on her own, right? So she had been doing something, but she wanted to start her own um, private uh, business, her own sole practitioner or uh, sole practice. And so she is now doing that here. So where you're really going to get the help with that career development is probably going to be through Professor Morgan and I, just because we know what's out there. Sure, sure. Of. Yeah, your knowledge of, of the industry really well. So, um, so just before we sort of switch over to maybe like the admissions process and maybe a little bit with the financial aid, how people are going to find a way to fund this. But um, what about like people that that do encounter something come up too within the program, as you said earlier? So if something, you know, if they're able to reach out to you and it's like they're expecting something to happen or something unexpected happens. I mean, is there ability for them to kind of work with directly with you to make sure that they're going to still be, you know, kind of in good standing and not jeopardize anything here? Yeah. Um, we really try to work very directly with the students. The only thing that we need is to know what's going on. So when a student writes us and says, look, you know, I mean, we've had a variety of, of family issues come up. I mean, you guys have families, you have um, clients. So a variety of things can come up. And then as soon as we know that, we can start working with all of the professors. So we tell you at the beginning of orientation, look, let me, Professor Flowers, know when there's an issue coming up and we can work with your faculty members to figure out how we get around that. Now, it may mean that you have to take a leave of absence or you have to do something um, to kind of stop the education for a, a, a time. But we want to make sure you understand that you're welcome back when when that whatever crisis comes up. We've unfortunately had people, you know, have very massive traffic accidents in the middle of their first semester. Mm -hmm. um, we're really proud that she is back in the in the program and is right. going to graduate with us. So, you know, it, it works. It just requires communication. Right. And with technology, communication is an easy thing to have happen. And we're quite accessible here anyway. I'd like we to are. think we're a pretty friendly bunch. So by all means, um, I've worked with Professor Flowers for years and I've always had that experience. So, um, okay, well, I mean, I thought maybe we just shift a little bit over um, to maybe some admissions processes sure. and the financial aid um, component too, because I'm sure some people are wondering about that. I do know in terms of the financial aid process, um, you know, uh, we will accept the FAFSA. We use federal aid here at Stetson. Um, and, but there's uh, other options as well too. Too, including, including um, you know, for those of you that might be veterans, might want to tap into some veterans be benefits as well. I mean, we're an unlimited yellow ribbon program. Um, you know, we're very military friendly institution and have got national standing um, for that for a number of years. Um, so certainly that's an option for you. And we do have um, a VA certifying official right here on campus and she's just outstanding. So um, if anyone wants to ever um, reach out, I mean, you can always reach out to Elder Law, I believe Elder Law at law.stetson.edu. Yes. And I don't know if we can get that on the screen as well, but that's a good resource for you too. Um, but you can always just call our um, call our admissions office too, and we can always get um, you all in, in you know, to the right departments, et cetera, to make sure those accessibility is there. But Absolutely. So regarding the financial aid, so yes, we will do the FAFSA as a possibility for some of you. Some of you are working for maybe firms and com companies that have employment benefits as well. So you might want to consider some of those. There are also, I did check with the business office, we do have some type of payment plan option, depending on how many credits each individual, you know, sometimes if you are a working professional, you might want to pay as you go a little bit. 
and we do have a plan where it's a certain percentage down, I guess 20 percent um, of the tuition down for that semester. And then there's three sort of, I think, balance payments following that. I think there's a hundred dollar charge to do that. But for some people that actually have the resources to pay as you go, it might be a nice way to actually sort of fund the education um, as well. Yeah. And I will tell you, um, Darren, we have had um, several people graduate from our LLM program using the veterans program. Mm -hmm. So um, and um, Jennifer. Jennifer Kong. Yeah, is just phenomenal in helping them figure out how to kind of negotiate all of those kind of weird rules that are involved with the veterans area. And as you said, we've also had students that were funded by their employers, right? That their employers wanted to maybe get into this niche and wanted to get their their uh, associate ready to do that. So we've had a variety of different ways that people have been able to pay for the program. Sure, sure. And so I understand, um, so in your office, Jessica Zook, she's the admin, like she helps do some of your processes, et cetera, too. So exactly. she's also another resources in your yeah. in your office if, in the event that you were not available or something like that. So um, we'll get that information on the screen for you as well, too. Um, so hopefully you can use that. So let's- And, and let me just yeah, mention sure. for a second. Um, and, and Jessica would be the one that would be able to, will be helping get you through the process of, of the application process. And she also is very able to send to you references of all kinds of people that have graduated last year all the way up until our first year in 2007. Um, she will try to um, zero in on people that may be in the same area that you're in. Um, so that would be a good networking for you to talk to them also. Right. So please let us know if you would like to, to reach out to one of our graduates. Um, we're very uh, glad to do that um, because I think that you will find that they found their experience here to be not only interesting, but also so really took their career to the next level. And that's really what an LLM should do for you. You don't want to take an LLM that's just going to basically just be another education. It should be the ability for you to jump into or jump farther than you could have gone had you not taken that LLM. Oh, yeah. No, that's nicely said. So and it is personable, too. So, you know, that part. So, well, let's just talk a little bit about admissions then um, and what that admissions process will look like. I mean, all of you have gone through the JD process at some point. Point. Um, and so we still actually use the Law School Admissions Council for this admissions process if you want to go that route. But there's also um, a direct application right on our website, too. So there's a PDF application right there. So, for example, if you're just going to apply directly to Stetson and only Stetson, and you know you're only applying to this program because of their, you know, the expertise in this area, specifically elder law, I mean, you know, you don't need to necessarily up, uh, go through LSAC in order to do that. You could just submit your application directly through us. So it's on the website. There's also a link to LSAC for the, the for the LLM CAS is what they call it. If you, you know, for those of you who remember your JDs, it was the JD CAS prior, um, but now they have what they call an LLM CAS. So that's another kind of outlet for you. So there's two options to be able to do that. So, so let's talk about like the admissions um, sort of cycle then. So, um, is there an opening date and a, an end date for this cycle? Or, I mean, you know, yeah. for us, I know in the JD side, we have October 1 to really till May, but I think it's a little bit different with the LLM. It is. Um, we have a very much a rolling admission. So we are looking at the applications as they come in. Um, so we don't have a begin date and an end date. We just, when they come in, we um, look at them and we uh, decide whether the person um, fits into the program or not. Um, we usually try to say that we'd like to have them done by July. Um, but I'm not going to lie to you and say that if you sent it in at the end of July as opposed to July 1st, we wouldn't look at that application. But remember, you want to give us time to be able to get you into the process and get you ready to go for that August date. So the sooner you do it, the better, obviously. Um, but we are looking at applications up until the end of July. Okay, excellent. So you have a good long like admission good cycle. Long yeah. time to explore all the things. Right, because I mean, sometimes when people are considering programs like this too, sometimes it takes a little bit more of an onboarding. Some people have thought about it for a while. Some people recently sort of brought the idea. Somebody brought it to their attention, and they're like, "Oh, well, let me find out because um, you know this is something I'm really interested in advancing." So, so in terms of the uh, the application process too. So we have the actual application too. I uh, the 
personal statement. I understand it can yes. be anywhere from what three to five pages. Yeah, um, and you know, two to two to th two to four is two to four is, is plenty. Is, is plenty. Yeah. And it really is what is, so it's going to address like you know why you actually want to take this degree. Why do you want to embark on getting an LLM when you have the JD and how this is going to help you get to the next level? That's what right. we're really kind of looking for in that That's area. That's what we're looking at. And it's interesting, Darren, because we see a lot. Um, you mentioned this earlier, but we see a lot of people deciding to go into elder law because they have had a personal issue, right? Yeah. Where I mean, not a personal issue, but an issue with a family member, um, a close friend who couldn't get through this whole uh, elder law issues because they didn't have somebody to guide them. And so we see a lot of personal statements um, that always kind of get to my heartstrings of talking about, you know, my mom was very sick. We couldn't get, we couldn't get mm -hmm. the, the benefits we needed to get her into the right nursing home, or, you know, we couldn't get the doctors to help us figure out where she should be. All of the things that elder law attorneys do. Um, remember that elder law is really about the difference between elder law and estate planning is really that elder law is about planning for the end of your life, like to make your life here on earth. Well, yes, we do estate planning, right? For after you're gone. On. But more importantly, we want you to have a good life while you're still here. And so that's really the difference between just estate planners who just do wills and trusts for after you're gone and true elder law attorneys who are really concerned not only with what happens to your money after you're gone, but how you can live a good life while you're still here. Sure. Sure. And I think we can all relate to that on some level, <laughs> yes. right, too. I mean, I right. think we just actually had somebody in the Office of Admissions where I'm working, too. There's somebody just passed, like, I'm unexpectedly, and they just had a number of issues. And she, she, she put out, like, a public service announcement. It's like everyone needs to make sure they have like their will done and they need to think about these things too yeah. and there's processes in yeah. place and it can really be helpful to people. Exactly. Um, uh, so so in terms of the rest of the application process, so we have the personal statement. I, I understand there are a couple of letter recommendations that we, right. you know, we, right. we require a, a couple. I think right. we have two. We could take up to three right. for that and you know a lot of people in the profession, they probably have some good contacts already. Absolutely. So I don't think that's a real struggle for most Not people. Not usually. Yeah, in order to secure those too. So there's no application fee for this process, too. So, you know, don't think about having to submit an application fee to submit an application to the LLM. So um, and I think that sort of probably pretty much wraps up the application process, too. I mean, you know, it's we're just looking for, you know, certain things that you're probably very sim similar to your JD application, too. But then just a little bit more because you're going to have a little bit more work experience having worked in the right. uh, as an attorney, a practicing attorney. Um, right. And the final thing is we have to have transcripts from all of oh, your your sure. um, understanding graduate and I know people are like, why do we need to have the transcripts if I've already gone to law school? Well, we have to have the whole record. We have auditors. We have people that are checking to make sure. So um, we need to have all the transcripts from all of your undergraduate and your um, JD program. Sure. And based on our accreditation with American Bar Association, there are certain requirements that we're going to need for everyone that actually not only applies, but actually matriculates into the law school as yeah. well. It's part of that accreditation process. So Exactly. So, yeah, so that sort of um, sort of summarizes mostly the admissions process. It's not going to be rocket science for many of you. It's just a pretty standard application. Um, and then we're going to review them after that. I understand there's a committee that actually is going to review right. them. And actually, um, if it's anything like the JD program, we get decisions out fairly quickly. Pretty quickly, um, So yeah. you'll know you'll right. know a pretty good idea if you right. are selected for this program. So, right. um, so I mean... That's kind of an overview. I mean, if there is something maybe, um, you know, you actually want to ask specifically, some things people have individual comments that they want to do, and that's what we're here for as well. So by all means, um, remember elderlaw at law.stetson.edu for that. But I mean, did you want to kind of maybe close with anything specifically for these students? And, you know, and yeah. what, if they're thinking about this, like, I mean, what, uh, you know, what is your, your closing thoughts on this? Right. Well, first of all, I mean, there's going to be somebody that wants to know what does this cost, right? Right? Like, what does this cost? Um, yeah. It is $1,400 per semester credit um, throughout the semester. Um, you don't pay for the conference. Um, you only pay for the meals you're going to uh, eat at the conference. And so that one credit is not going to be $1,400. So um, that's kind of the cost of the program. I think the other thing that we hear a lot from, Darren, is can I really do this, right? Like I've got these other things going on. I would love to do this, but can I really do it? And all I can say is, yes, you can. Um, but I'm sitting here. I didn't do the LLM program. So that's why I so encourage you. If you were sitting back saying, 
you know what? I just don't know if I can do this. I so strongly you encourage you to reach out um, under el elderlaw.org law.stetson.edu um, and send us a request to talk to somebody that has actually been through the program. And if you tell us a little bit about yourself, right, I have kids or I have this kind of a practice or I, I live here or whatever, then we can kind of zero in on somebody that had the same issues. Um, I will tell you, we had somebody graduate from our LLM with seven children in the house. Um, and okay. so it, it can be done. Um, it, it requires some um, some finagling, but mm -hmm. we all do that, right, as parents. The other thing I wanna kinda conclude with though, which I think is really important, and, and that is, this is really an opportunity for you, if you are interested in elder law, to dig down deep into that area, um, to walk away with a really firm foundation of elder law, all of the varieties. I mean, elder law is a very broad-based you know, area of law, right? It's not just criminal law or torts. It's what is going to impact elderly, right? From housing to uh, guardianships, to estate planning, um, to government benefits. So this is really a way for you to really get um, an, an academic education in that area. But that's not all, right? I mean, the other thing is that we truly believe this is a practical way for you to obtain practical ways of how to actually practice the area of elder law. And so we love that combination. We love that we do those two things. We think very well. Um, and all I can say to you is if you have any questions, you can find me at flowers at law.stetson.edu um, or the elder law um, email that we've given you a couple of times. Or if you see this on YouTube, you can actually put questions into the YouTube um, area, the chat on, on YouTube, comments. comments on YouTube, and we will answer those as quickly as we can also. So we're here to help you make this decision. Um, if you talk to me and you say, uh, you know what, I don't think this is what I want to do. That's okay because, you know, we've had people that have said, well, I'm really interested in estate planning. And I say, you know what? This is really elder law. Yes, we teach estate mm -hmm. planning. Yes, we teach estate gift and tax. Um, we teach all of those things, but we teach it from an idea of dealing in the area of elder law. Um, and so if you have any questions, you are concerned this might not be the right fit for you, please give me a call and we'll have a great conversation. That sounds really great. Um, well. Hopefully you found this all to be a really beneficial time spent here. I mean, I've certainly enjoyed it and I've even learned a few things. I mean, I'm having been in JD side for a number of years, I always learned something from the LLM side too. But I mean, like I always say to some JD students that are contemplating this, it's like, well, you're gonna get two years older anyway. So sometimes advancing yourself too and, and finding a, a, a program that's gonna work within your schedule and parameters to make it work because it could be really lucrative for you in the long run. and hitting professional goals and and really just being able to help serve a population that is really expanding in our in our in American life. Yeah. I mean, it's just without a doubt. I mean, it's a big growing 10,000 people turn 65 every single day. Yes. So we we are a a um, growing aging population, sure. not just in the United States, but globally. And so it's a very interesting um, time to be in elder law. Sure. Well, thank you all. I hope that you found this to be informative. Special thanks to Professor Bobby Flowers um, for her time and her expertise. Um, and I'm Darren Kettles in the JD office um, and the Office of Admissions. And I'm always able to help as well, too. So thank you all for your time. And we hope to see your application soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you for watching Stetson Law Live. We hope you've enjoyed today's program. For the next few minutes, our contact information will remain on the screen. Thanks for watching.